now that I haven't had for a while. I would give you a very nice talk about the indoor microbiome if Jack had sequenced any of the samples that I sent him. So he has not done so. So I was, he was busy putting talks together, apparently. Right? Get to work, pal. I will talk about the indoor microbiome and what I have done and what I'm ready to do once he gets around to helping me out. Um, but I'm going to talk about my previous work in the indoor microbiome, uh, work on and, and uh, give you a little perspective on my background. I started out in the Norm Pace lab and some of the studies I've done, which I call low throughput sequencing studies. Um, I'm going to give some results about that and some conclusions to give you how I think about the indoor microbiome. Then I'm going to go to towards my more recent studies, my higher throughput studies, although I think all the people at the BGI would probably laugh at my throughput. Um, and then my plans to work on into the indoor microbi microbiome, or the, what do you want to call it? The virome, whatever. Viruses in the home or in offices or wherever. Um, and ironically enough, I show a picture of San Diego outdoors, of course. Uh, I just want to point out to Claire, is Claire here? It's not always, always this nice. <laughs> yes, of course it is. All right, so I really like this quote, uh, and I'm, this comes from a paper by Norm Pace, and I think it really says what we all, what we all think is it. I mean, humans really just don't pay attention, but we're moving through a sea of much of our own bacteria as we go through these environments, and we don't pay attention to it until it really is a disease, okay? But it's all around us, it's really fascinating, and for my studies, it's such an incredibly interesting environment I'm going to argue that by studying the endomicrovirome, we're actually coming to understand microbial ecology that much better because it's such a unique situation. All right, so reasons to study the indoor microbiome. Well, we spend 90% of our time in the indoors, and I can tell you right now, I mean, how many hours have we actually gone outside since we've been at this conference, all right? Now, San Diego, you can probably get away with, you know, only 70% of your time indoors, and I rather like it about San Diego. But most places, we're indoors a lot, and China is certainly moving that direction. So we should know more about it. Disease transmission. I think we really have to understand the importance of inert surfaces, how long can things persist on surfaces? How often you touch a surface and touch your eyeball, touch a surface, I mean, people are touching themselves all the time. We really, uh, yes, and each other. I don't know. This, I'm not going this direction. All right, it's really important. Opportunistic infections. I mean, in the United States alone, you know, 100,000 deaths a year can be traced to infections that you get in the hospital. I don't know about you, but I go to the hospital to get better, okay? Not to die, all right? You go in and you're like, you've got tubes in you, you've got holes in you, your skin is a great barrier to infection, but there's been 100 sick people in that bed before you, okay? So you might catch something. We need to understand that. I don't think it's simply from people touching each other. I think they play an important role. Sick building syndrome, we can go on and on about this, but there's many cases where we don't really understand what is making people sick in this environment. Is it a fungi? Is it is a bacteria? Is it a virus? We really need to know these things. Um, and I think it's a fascinating environment in its own right. And I'm going to point out some cases where the microbial environment of the indoors is such a unique ecosystem. It's such a unique way to select for certain kind of microbes that you would never see in other environments. And I'll give you an example of that. All right, so my low throughput sequencing studies, these are studies that I've done through clone library analysis. This is where we started. This is the norm pace kind of stuff. It's 16 acids cloning. But as uh, we were shown, I think Greg showed a nice study, even with a few clone sequences, right, you can actually get an amazing picture of these ecosystems and how really unique each of the ecosystems are. I started off as a shower curtain guy. All right, so I had the shower curtain, and Norm Pace comes to me with the dirtiest, nastiest shower curtain you have ever seen. He retired the said, what do you think of this? And he slaps it down like that. And it turned out to be fascinating. He got into a really nice paper. It was, of course, really complex, loaded with bacteria of all certain sorts, but it was really specialized. In each of these environments, you could see things popping out that said, this is a unique environment. What we saw in the shower curtain was loads of Sphingomonas and Methylobacteria all over the shower curtain. You know that stuff that you think is soap scum? It ain't soap scum, okay? <laughs> it's a biofilm, all right? And these things are from the water and they're eating your skin cells and they're probably eating the curtain. Who knows? Uh, child care center. Well, that's a lovely place, right? Child care centers are really nice. I mean, you got kids spilling food and crap all over the time. You got diaper changing right in the room, okay? So 
So what do we find? We've got pseudomonas covering all surfaces, everywhere, right? And then fecal bacteria, everywhere, you know? Fecal bacteria. That could change right there. Uh, airplane surfaces, don't go on an airplane, all right? When you go on, actually, stay in the airplane, just don't use the lab chair. I don't care how long the flight is. Hold it, okay? It's disgusting. Even the paper towels are covered with it, right? Yeah, it's gross. I mean, you can imagine, it's like that flushing noise, wee! And like, how many people use the darn thing? All right, um, I'm gonna give you an example of the hospital therapy pool, one of my favorite studies that we went through. Again, I go to the hospital to get well, and so do these people. So hospital therapy pools, we studied this one in Boulder, Colorado, where the lifeguards inside a hospital therapy pool, it's a nice, warm, hot, tubby-like environment, okay? And the people are in the therapy pool are doing exercises, trying to get better, improve themselves from their illnesses. But the lifeguards were coughing up blood. This is bad, all right? So like, it turns out that they're not allowed to chlorinate the pool because, you know, they're indoors. It's completely surrounded indoors. And the, and the chlorine, just you can imagine if you're a lifeguard and it's clapped in there and it's hot and the chlorine was just burning there. So they couldn't chlorinate as much as they want. But of course, the other problem is they're coughing up blood. So we went and we sampled the water and we sampled the air. And I did this work with Lars Anginet, um, so who's uh, applying for some Sloan funding. He's a great guy. Um, but he did some really great air sampling method, looked at what was inside the water. And it turned out to be really quite diverse and quite interesting and also um, we're playing. So these are just individual clone library samples, and these are just now pie charts to give you a sense of the kind of diversity that we're seeing. We're seeing all sorts of kind of stuff. We start to see snake and lotus, proteobacteria, mycobacteria, huh? Mycobacteria tuberculosis. You heard of that guy, right? Um, we see proteobacteria. And then in the air, we saw this. So these are all water samples here. Very diverse, kind of on the biofilm. But in the air, heavily enriched from mycobacteria. Heavily enriched. And just from our simple clone libraries, we're looking at 50 different new species, uncultured, both slow-growing and fast-growing mycobacteria. I mean, mycobacteria, um, there's actually this potter's lung disease that you can get, that you can breathe in the bacteria, right? And you get this, you, know, you get bloody lungs, just like you have tuberculosis. So we really think it's enriching uh, in the pool water, it's a nice growth medium for the mycobacteria. And then the bubbles, as it's bubbling up, they probably spit these uh, guys in, in higher concentrations into the air. And they're breathing them into their lungs. So this is the kind of study, uh, this is the kind of research that I think the indoor environment is really, really interesting. Okay, so then I'm going to talk to you about my high throughput studies. Actually, BGI probably laugh at what I consider high throughput. For at San Diego State, it's all right. So these are multi, uh, multiplex power sequence studies. I'm going to go over two of them using the 16S barcode um, Pioneer by Mitch Sogan. And I'm using the techniques uh, used by Noah Ferrier in, in the night, in night lab and all that kind of stuff. Uh, the first study I'm going to talk to you about is an office building study we did. We did New England. Jeez, this should be New York. Sorry. New York, San Francisco, and Tucson. And we're really trying to get it. What is the typical diversity of the office microbiome? All right, and I, I probably laugh at me if someone does HVAC work. What's a typical? But you'll see that there are some clear patterns, and they are quite interesting. Um, so what is the typical diversity? We had a nesting sampling design where we had three buildings. Uh, we had a three cities, three buildings per city, 30 offices per building, and five sur uh, um, surfaces per office. So this is a surface-only study looking at the dust. It was about a 60-40 ratio of women to men. So we had a, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't idea, ideal in that sense, but it was pretty good. Um, we did, uh, well, we'd like a 50-50 ratio would have been nice, but we just grabbed the offices we could. We did bacterial counts. We talked about doing uh, bacterial counts and abundances. We used a very simple heterotrophic bacterial count assay that's often good, used to assess the number of viability of bacteria. Obviously, it doesn't capture a lot of the viability of bacteria, but I think it's a general measure of how many heterotrophic bacteria there are, and at least it's consistent sampling for every single environment. Um, and what we found was, you know, using the standard assay, um, we found that, you know, men tend to be dirty and well, what do we know there, right? Um, you know, San Francisco was a cleaner city out of, this is 450 samples, so this is a significant sample size. Um, and we did find out that the chair and the phone tend to be the most contaminated surfaces. And this was actually nice to know because we, were, we used that in our prior sequencing study. We can narrow down our search just to go at the, <coughs> at the sites that were the richest in terms of bacteria. So then we took a subset of those to do our 16S study. 
Uh, we did the chair and the phone. As I said, they're the most contaminated. We did 54 of the surfaces, 18 for city, just those two. As you can see, that they're the chair and the phone are the highest. Now, these are relative numbers, by the way. Um, and we pooled the barcoding. We did the whole pool barcoding thing. I don't need to tell you about that. What did we find out? All right, so this is a uh, plot of the various different divisions. All right, so this is divisional level analysis. I can go into many deeper ways, but I think it, it is sort of reaction plot. What do you call this kind of a plot? I don't know. So yeah, abundance plot, taxonomic abundance plot. Um, all the samples from New York that we did are down here, the San Francisco samples, and the Tucson samples. Just looking at it, eyeballing it, you can pretty much see that the Tucson samples are just stepping out a little bit. You can just see it, right? The patterns are, the colors are just a little different. And of course, we found organisms all across 20 different divisions of the bacteria. The sequence deep enough, you find just about everything in these environments. Um, and you can see that most of them are things like the bacteria, let's see, what do you have? The actinobacteria, big part, proteobacteria, firmicutes. The yellow is the cyanobacteria, which I thought was pretty good. What are the cyanos doing indoors, huh? Um, then the orange ones are the bacteria guys. And when you look at them in more detail, you're looking at human stuff. You're looking at stuff from every human orifice, essentially. You know, it's human skin is the big player. And you're looking at soils. All right? That's the big player. When you looked at the Tucson samples, you see a lot of this stuff just disappear. And we got a whole huge, you know, really big change, sea change in the kind of diversity. And some samples, we had nothing but firmicutes in these samples. And a lot of them completely disappeared out of these samples. So it seemed like New York and San Francisco had sort of this steady kind of, we could, we could see them. They overlap really nicely. I'll show that in the next slide. But these two are totally different. Or um, the Tucson samples can be completely different. I did want to also point out something that really strange and our viewers gave us a lot of grief about, but I think it turned out to be really interesting, is we found these very small numbers of sequences. And they show up in these division plots because you're plotting divisions. We saw things from uh, not only cyanobacteria, but things like the chloroflexi. These are, these are organisms found in geothermal environments. They're, they're you know, photosynthesizers but in hot spring. Dinococcus and thermos, you know what those are? The guys that survive massive doses of radiation live in salt environments. We find OP11. This is a geothermal organism. And people thought, well, you're just contaminated. What are these things doing here? Well, we looked at another study, the restrooms, which I'm going to uh, um, show you later, that we're modeling our virus study. Those same guys are all there. They're all there. They're not living in that environment. That's not where they live. But it's an inert sort of habitat where they can collect. And so in a way, it's a way to look at how these things can actually disperse. Because you can't argue that they're living in the restroom or they're living in the offices, but they're still there. All right. So when you look at these and you do a principal components analysis, what I like about this is you can see the red and the blue are the New York and San Francisco office, and the Tucson ones cluster completely apart from one another. So this is a really nice thing to show how specialized is a signature environment. How much time do I have? I'm oh, sorry, I can't see. Um, which I think is nice. When I looked at this more carefully, um, these guys, what you really separated these guys out, stop laughing at talk. These guys uh, uh, was, they were all these uh, soil bacteria from the desert. So you really, had, I really think that's what was, was putting them apart. Okay, a second study that, okay, thank you. A uh, high future study I want to talk about is my newborn intensive care unit study. Same process, different question. The question in this case was, what is the role of the innate hospital environment in potentially in infection? Now, when you look at NICUs, you're looking at really high rates of infection. You've got babies that are like a pound in weight with tubes all through their body. 65% of these extremely low birth weight infants get at least one infection, at least one during their time there. 27% mortality rate. All right, this is enormous. This is disastrous, OK? Um, we looked at two San Diego NICUs, and we looked at frequently touched services. They try their best, but these places are crowded, and lots of people are moving through. What we did find was genera of known opportunistic pathogens on every single service. We found things like Neisseria, Pseudomonas, Streptococcus, Staphylococcus, Hastinobacter, Clostridium, Fusobacteria. All of these guys have known at one part or another to cause some kind of opportunistic infections. All right? The other thing we saw is there are two NICUs that we looked at, blue and red. You don't really need to know what they are. We saw this really nice clustering. And this was a single time plan. I wish we could have done a time series. But that turned out to be dominated by Enterobacteriaceae. Well, what happens in NICUs? They're also changing diapers. And the nurses will tell you about blowouts when everything escapes. Okay? 
So, you know, I think that there, if you do these over time, you can show points where infections could spread rapidly through these environments from reasons like that. All right, so the talking points I wanted to establish, I think it's useful to establish a baseline of typical contamination in these environments to detect departures like that, like those systems. If you have a typical baseline, you can look when things change, like a disease coming through. Um, there's clear evidence for robust innate immune uh, bacteria all over these environments. I think it's really worth looking into. And it sort of inspired a, a model I have for looking into the um, indoor microbiome. So, for instance, uh, you've got several sources in the microbiome. You've got the human sources, you've got the environment sources, water and soil. You've got a filter, right, which is the humidity or the pH or the HVAC system of the buildings that tells you what actually can like the, the hospital pool or the formaldehyde in the carpet that makes this environment so novel and unique. And it really inspired our uh, source tracker program, which I've already mentioned, which is to look at what proportion of these environments, is some software we wrote to look at what proportion of the environment comes from any given community. And this is going to be really important to get the EMP stuff. But for instance, I, I don't want to go through all this too much, but you can look at a single sample, say, from a NICU, and ask what proportion of the community is likely to have come from skin or soil or we don't know, and you can get estimates using this. Or what proportion of the office from skin or soil or some other community. And so it really inspired that. In fact, I also, it's also potentially useful for things in the study. People were studying fresh water, which had a lot of soil contamination. You can use Source Tracker to ask how much of the soil is contributing to your fresh water ecosystem and how much for your insect guts. The same thing. So yeah, I thought I'd turn it out. All right, I'm going to move on to the Byron Project because I know you're all dying to hear about it. Um, the Byron Project is uh, what we're on to now is that basically virtually nothing is known about indoor viruses. So let's get into it, all right? And uh, biobacterial diversity, this study is going to be on the biobacterial diversity in male and female restrooms over time. There's already been a nice study about that. The study design is going to take the same three surfaces. We're going to sterilize them early in the morning, completely sterilize them, and then check them at the end of the day to see what's built up. So we know that everything that's there in our sample happened at the end of that day. We're going to repeat it every week for two months. We've actually already finished all the collecting. All right. Um, and we're also going to do 16S bacteria. Jack's going to do this. And viral shotgun library sequences um, of these samples. All right, and we're following up an excellent study by Flores et al. in the night lab that's already showed us where we should sample. Okay, so here's the situation. They did a biogeography of the restroom based on 16S, and they found three nice clusters. They found that the floor, the soap dispenser, and the toilet seat were very representative of the overall diversity. So we're gonna, that's why we picked each of those environments, and we'll just sample them over time. It was a really nice study. Now we're going to do the viruses on top of that. First thing you do, we're going to make sure that they're clean. And this is actually harder than you think it is, all right? People say Clorox bleach kills everything, and it does if you leave it for 20 minutes, all right? So we put that in the women's restroom unclean. There's plenty of crap there, okay? Two minutes of 10% bleach, you'd think that would be enough. No, there's plenty. These are all cyber green, uh, cyber gold uh, staining. About 20 minutes later, you know anyone who leaves bleach on a surface for 20 minutes? Do the cleaning people do that? No. Now, these surfaces aren't clean, all right? So after 20 minutes, we finally got something clean. Probably could be 10 minutes, you know? I haven't done the exact time, but it was a long time you had to lift them. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna take these samples, we're gonna filter them, we're gonna season chloride isolation, DNA and RNA extraction. We've talked about this same principle that we've done before. Um, and we're gonna use seasoning chloride spin filtration to figure out, uh, to isolate the bacterial or viral particles um, which we're checking each time under the microscope to make sure that we really are enriching for viral particles. Then we're going to do, you know, the shotgun medicine sequencing and probably RNA uh, reverse transcriptase. And let's see, I think that's, I think that was stuck there. Uh, I did want to put, put a plug out to Greg Caparasa, who's actually written a program that we worked on together called Shotgun Unifrac, where we could actually um, correlate the bacterial and viral communities from every sample that we collect to see how they relate to one another. So, and with that, thanks Paula and Jack especially. Well, thank you, Scott. Anything like 
I have no idea. Would change? I have no idea. We didn't take any of that. We had no Meemark samples of the uh, uh, standards at the time. We don't have any of the information, the humidity. We were, it's very embarrassing, actually. So it's a, a single time point. It, it, it could be. It could be that randomly people are tracking this stuff into their into their offices because this was like their personal little biome on their desk, you know. And so some people went hiking that day and they, and you know didn't wash their hands or you know. So there's a lot of that. Probably a lot of variability of the people going on there. Hi, Tom. Is this uh, the apocryphal story? I'm sure you've heard it, but I like it anyway. Uh, I think it was Demerick or Rebecca wrote, this was in the heyday of bacteria fires, wrote to a scientist and asked for the fires, and the scientist wrote back a letter, email, saying that, sorry, I can't give it to you. We, 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 uh, so, uh, the just shredded it and captured it and got back to the phone. <laughs> <laughs> I like Microbial world is a hearty world. Yeah. Anyway, um, I should point out, I did want to point out one thing. Um, as far as an educational perspective of the indoor microbiome, um, you know, you can talk about shower curtains to anybody. My students just, you know, when I talk about the microbial diversity, there's nothing better than talking about things that are so personal to them. They're like, what is that scum on my shower curtain? Yeah, I was wondered about.